Black episode twenty five. Black at it again. You feel me? Like we never left. You feel me? Two days in a row. Two days. That's that's Black history. Yeah. This is also some history. I think this is the first time we had just Patron, and not some form of Hennessy or Hennessy and Patron put together. You know, I would have got the Hennessy. AKA like, Patron. Hey, I'm trying to stay away from sugar. I said stay away from sugar. So the I've been doing sure. really good with my meal preps. <laughs> trying to stay on that. Niggas hating, but you know. I ain't hating, bro. The world be hating. Episode twenty five. Bro, mm. that's crazy, bro. Like, I really never thought we would do 25 episodes of Hell Black Podcast. I never thought people would actually just want to listen to us to a f- talk. We, I know we say <laughs> that, right? And people don't take it that serious. Like, yeah. nigga, even now to this day, I was talking to Kate, my homegirl. I might have said that on the episode yesterday. Did I? I don't know. Your homegirl, yeah. You was yeah. talking something about it. Yeah, but like, I don't know. The podcast, I have a sort of disconnect to this shit as a means to keep me humble. So... And I think I've always had that intention from the beginning is not to get too caught up in this podcast life type shit. So if somebody would have asked us if we was going to be doing, you know, 25 episodes in, I wouldn't have believed it. But yeah. Podcast life, bro. What is what is a podcast life? We podcasters, nigga. <laughs> like, I know some lit ass niggas from podcasts. You be telling me about all the niggas who be making hella money from this shit? Yeah. yeah. We get niggas be lit. That's true. We might we might be on our way there to them Wells Fargo sponsorships. We <laughs> might be a, by, you know. Jay Z, Rock Nation. We might just be a few podcasts away from that sponsorship, but here we are. This is a, this is also a dope episode, episode twenty five, because we got somebody here with us who I've been trying to get on the podcast forever now, and now this nigga's here. And it's the first place we recorded. Like this is where Hella Black originated, bro. Oh shit, <laughs> nigga, what the fuck? <laughs> so we had oh, the first shit. episode, bro. Remember that this shit? Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Black yeah. Black neighborhood. Yeah. Oh shit, that's crazy. So yeah, we got my nigga Raj in here. Raj, say something for the people. What's up, man? I appreciate y'all having me on Hella Black. Let's get it. Eeh. We got, for those that don't know, for those that don't know, Raj is probably the second greatest person to graduate from Willard Middle School behind myself. <laughs> probably the second greatest person to graduate from Berkeley High School behind Sh- myself. Shit talking has already started. You know, it's not shit talking. It's, it's, I'm admiring him while also building myself up. I'm admiring, I'm, you know, I'm admiring him by building myself up. But also, this is nuts. I've known Raj since I was 11 years old. And if you if I would have thought, okay, fucking what's that? Fifteen years later, I would be in this nigga's studio recording a podcast when I probably didn't know what a studio was at that time or the podcast. The podcast. <laughs> shit is lit, bro. Raj, how you doing? I'm good, man. I'm I'm happy to be on y'all shit and seeing y'all grow and shit has been crazy. I forgot that y'all did the first episode over here, but I do kind of remember that. That's wild. So it's, it's dope seeing y'all flourish. <laughs> I was selling roller, I was with my boy the other day. Hell, he hella randomly brought up y'all podcast and I talk about podcasts a lot. He's like, "You listen to hella black." I was like, "That's my boy." <laughs> what you mean? <laughs> so that's hella clean, bro. Y'all, y'all doing y'all shit right now. You know, we got a good episode in store today. You feel me? You know what I'm gonna say if you're a listener. Like us on SoundCloud. Subscribe on iTunes. Give us a five star review. If ain't five stars, don't give us a review at all. If you don't like what we're saying, you know, we ain't forcing you to listen. But it's hella black. Use the hashtag hella black podcast. We got a good episode in store. So what we going to pres- to pres- subscribe to the Patreon? Yeah, we in here sipping on Patron, you feel me? So subscribe to our Patreon. I think I want to make, you know how there's different levels on the Patreon? Mm-hmm. I think the next one is going to be like $40 and like you could sponsor our bottle of Patron for the episode. Mm-hmm. I think that's the next one. White folks tap in. Hello. If you white and you listen to this shit, pay up. Don't listen for to black real. shit for free, don't bro. Be, don't be taking this black game, you know, these black experiences and just soaking it all up. And you're probably using it for your DEI workshops at work and shit. Probably using them, you know, to implement little strategies and shit at your nonprofit or whatever, you know, putting little quotes on your board if you're a white teacher or some shit. Cite um, us and pay us pay right me. now. Patreon.com slash Hell Black Pod. Raj, do you want to use this as an opportunity? I don't know. Do you want to pub your podcast? I think you should. You know, we got to go. Uh, yeah, we got to <laughs> pub your shit, bro. Sorry, man. Yeah, pub your shit. My shit ain't out. <laughs> My shit ain't even out yet, but <laughs> stay tuned. Drop? When it do drop, I got a podcast coming out. I don't know when it's dropping, but we figuring it out. You feel me? Just a little bit of pub. You know, just be aware. It's coming soon. Also, you can tell, for those that don't know, Raj is Rex Life Raj, the dopest nigga. Your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. That's that's a fact. If you look at, do you not, do you, what, what's that like though? Like when niggas say, you feel me? Like your favorite rapper, favorite rapper. Like is, ain't that like kind of like, well, whatever nigga, where that bag at? <laughs> do, you, do you be feeling like that? Like, that's why I'm like, fuck, fuck, respect. We're the bag. How do you feel about what a nigga called? Because I know niggas. 
I know because I've said it about you before. Like, oh, this is my favorite artist. This, the, I know you hear that you're the hottest nigga in the Bay over and over again. I know you hear that. I know you see it, right? I think it's cool. It's tight. I'm with you, though. I'm about the bag for sure. But it's dope. It's humbling, though, to see people really fuck with me, especially, like, when I be sitting here really trying to, like, hone in on my own kind of sound, you know what I'm saying, and not always trusting in myself and then putting it out and people fuck with it and they're receptive of it. It's, it's a good feeling, so I, I appreciate all the love. But, yeah, I'm with the bag shit, too. I need that. Facts, fast. We all three got something here in common, you know. I think me, me and B was talking about this, besides us all being black, you two niggas being big and black. Um, <laughs> the other thing we all have in common is we were all Division One college athletes. And Raj has sent me some shit where he was on a podcast, with his, his podcast, and he was talking about like that, the, his, uh, his experience as an athlete. And I'm like, that's something I would definitely like to cover um, if we ever get a chance to get him on our shit. And it's wild because although we were like, I feel like we all had some of like similar experiences, but also hella different. Right. Yeah. Especially in this moment right now where you have athletes, you know, like Kaepernick was Eric Reed too, you know, jobless. Yeah. You feel me? Like where black athletes are starting to speak up and I think the topic of black athletes being exploited is really coming to the forefront like it's never been before, you know? I mean people always been talking about it, but I think now it's important to like actually listen to people's experiences. You feel me of, of being a black student athlete in, you know, it's a multi billion dollar industry, college football. Yeah, right. The, the experience of a black student athlete is wild. Especially like I went to the University of Idaho, Raj went to Boise State, which are both in Idaho, both super fucking white. Um, but I was like at a losing ass program. So I think my shit was even worse. Like when you getting your ass beat and getting extorted, it's like a double <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Like I think, like when you had a school like, like Boise State was yeah, winning, like when you had a school like Boise, like Bama type shit, like when y'all getting, you know, I mean, just the the system of college football is an exploitive system, bro. Like right, like niggas not getting paid, and Rod, you would know better as to far as like you went to a big program, a, a big. It was well, was it getting bigger? Like when you when you first got there, was it big or it got bigger as you were there? I think um, they were always kind of good. I think the year before I got there, maybe two years before, is when they won that first Fiesta Bowl when they did the trick play. So that's when, like, shit was getting really big. I think the year before I got there is when Coach Pete took over and he first started coaching. Um, But, yeah, it got bigger, you know, every year. Now I go back and the city is so big. It don't even look the same. Shit is different. The stadium's bigger. You know, they built different facilities. Even, like, when I was flying in, Last time I went, I flew in, and I was looking down because I thought the plane was about to land. And I was like, damn, I don't remember all this being here. But they're just building outward in the, like places like Meridian and Eagle and all these other places. It's huge, bro. It's, it's, way, it's really big. So it's pretty much like as the football team has gotten better and better and more and produced more and more, the, the economy in the city has also gotten bigger. Is that 100%. What you, yeah. 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 That's wild. Yeah, it's like when you out there, and he, he can speak to it too, when you in small town, I'm pretty sure like any state, not just Idaho, that school is the everything. It's no professional football teams out there. You feel me? Boise State and the Vandals, damn there was the professional teams out there. That's why the rivalry was so big. That's why it was sell out all the time. Like that's really like, it's a real college town. Everywhere is Boise, orange yeah. and blue, everywhere you go. So, yeah. It's nuts, it's nuts to me to think at because if you look at it, I think the football programs of every school, most of them are like the highest accumulating sport uh, f- at the college, right? Like football for some schools pay the scholarships for other sports, like sports for like field hockey. And so I think we talked about that before on the yeah. podcast on the expectation of black athletes, right? But you got to think about it. Rogers at a school where niggas was winning bowl after bowl, winning 11 games, winning 10 games. TV and I'm contracts. sure you had niggas who were still starving on the squad. Um, we had it was it was interesting. I feel like at Boise at least they treated us pretty well. It's like, niggas wasn't really in need for nothing. I, but I'm speaking for myself too. Also being the guy who had a scholarship, it was for sure walk ons and stuff. And, and I feel like they had a hard time. You know what I'm saying? Like if the FAFSA or FAFSA, however you say it, wasn't kicking in like it was supposed to, or they didn't have parents or somebody who could provide for them. Because even though I had a scholarship. But it was still times for show where I had to hit moms or I had to hit pops like I need some cheese because it was like and it was always a thing for me. Like I never knew at other colleges what they made because I feel like other colleges, it was niggas like I heard people was getting 15, 1600 a month where like with our scholarly checks, we could pay the rent, get food, maybe have a little bit 
you know, to fuck around. But we didn't really have that much. But I heard other schools was like, you know, I don't know. But from my experience, we we was pretty solid. I know most scholarships are like determined by like the amount of the scholarship is determined of cost of living, right? So like in Idaho, in Moscow, our cost of living was hella low. Yep. I think my scholarly check was seven twenty a month. But niggas rent was like three fifty right. with bills. So like I think for bills and everything I probably had like four hundred dollars worth of shit, right? But I was getting a seven hundred twenty dollar check. So asking a nigga to live off like three hundred dollars for an entire month is sick. And even if I could make it stretch, it's like why are we making it stretch when the coaches and shit and the deans and everybody else is living good. That was my whole thing. Like, of course, there are situations. Like, I feel like the niggas at Washington State, which was nothing but five minutes away, I never heard those niggas complaining. But just because they wasn't complaining doesn't mean them niggas wasn't getting exploited. Right. But that's 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 where I look at it. Especially for us, like, most of us coming from, like, fucking poor families and shit. Like, I couldn't. Sometimes I could hit moms, but for sometimes, niggas, she was hitting me. Like, and you were sending some money back home. Me, like, for yeah. the most part. Like, when I used to get at the beginning of the at the beginning, your first scholarship checks... Like that one, the fall, the first scholarship check in the fall is always the fattest because you get FAFSA too. So you're going to get your fucking Pell Grant and then you're going to get your, because you're going to get your two fucking scholarship checks because in fall camp you don't get your check. In August you don't get a check. So you're going to get those two checks back to back. You're going to get the August check and the September mm-hmm. check plus your, your Pell Grant shit. So you're going to be fat. Nigga, I'm for sure sending cheese home off them first ones, right? Right. But I'm thinking like to where in the summer, that fucking summer when I had to do an early summer school session. Yeah. And I didn't know. I couldn't even get a job, bro, because I was taking so many classes. Nigga, I couldn't even... And I was still training, right? But that football's first, a full-time job, too. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have... Like, my coach don't got two jobs, nigga. Right. And I'm putting in just as much hours as that nigga ain't going to school, right? So I'm thinking about how that first summer session, bro, I remember, like, being dirt poor, and my coach was like, oh, uh, you feel me? Just... We got protein shakes and protein bars in the in the fucking... Uh, in the pantry. In the, in the weight room My nigga you not eating Fucking three peanut butter And jelly sandwiches A day to survive Why do I gotta eat that shit right. That would be my whole thing Is like I feel like college I feel like I know for a fact College athletes are not Seeing equality in the game And of course um, Even on a, on a pro level Right but when The the checks is like Millions In the pros It's like It, it makes it to where I, You hear people all the time Say oh you should just be grateful Type shit right Cause oh you are making Millions of dollars but What is a million To the nigga that's making Billions who ain't doing Nearly as much as I'm doing or putting their body on the line. Right. Ain't going to have CTE. Right? Like Jerry Jones. Like Jerry Jones <laughs> got probably better brain health than all his players. And the nigga 50 years older than everybody. Facts. Should be sick, bro. But it's all just about exploitation. Like, it's a whole other industry. You feel me? That is making billions and billions of dollars. And the players aren't seeing nothing. You know? So, it's like, even though you're getting a small check, it ain't nothing compared to what your coaches is making. You know? So, it's like... I see it as a whole other form of slavery, in my opinion. I mean, you hear that comparison all the time, just as far as like niggas putting their bodies on the line for very little to no wages. And niggas couldn't even play football until like the fifties, I believe. Like USC was one of the first integrated football teams. For real, they beat Bama. The coach at Alabama was hella happy that they got beat, so they could start having what black about, players. Uh, the team that where did Jim Brown go for college? I think Syracuse. Was it Jim Brown? Or who was who was the nigga before? No, Ernie Banks. Mm-hmm. Is that his name? You know they made that movie about, bro? Is it The Train or whatever? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Fuck, what's the nigga name? The running back. Is it Ernie Banks? Earl, Earl Thomas? Nah, nigga, what? <laughs> <laughs> this nigga's sick. Ernie, bro, y'all don't remember that movie, bro? The Train or whatever? I don't. Y'all, y'all gotta be serious. Y'all can't be serious. But basically, like, Alabama... You know, it was white only. And then they got beat by USC, which had an integrated team. You know, so then the coach was like, all right, for sure. Now we can get some black players. And after that, like, after they've been having black players, Alabama's been the most successful football team. You know, making billions of dollars. Yeah. Ernie Davis year was after his year. name, by the way. Y'all don't remember Ernie Davis, that movie they made about him? I mean, he don't. was like one of the first <laughs> black football Bro, players. Who the fuck was I thinking about? You just said Earl Thomas. Why that nigga that still plays. <laughs> <Bro>. <laughs> That nigga still plays, but Ernie Davis was one of the first I niggas. About Earl Campbell. Okay, yes, that's an old nigga, but even then he played in the eighties. Earl Ernie Davis was like one of the niggas. I think one of the first niggas to like kind of integrate college football. But yeah, bro, it's it's wild. And then I had a conversation with, with one of my homeboys. I was uh, we played high school together, and then we went to college like in the same area. And he was just talking. We had like talked about how all we knew was football, right? Like yeah. that's just. I, and I, I think that nigga played since he was like seven. 
So from seven years old, and he was also raw. So from seven years old, if you just raw, 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 every league, you the, every every year you're the best player on the team. You get to you want like the pedestal. division one. You just all you know is all you associate yeah. your life with is football, right? You begin to and associate then, like your self worth with it too. Yeah, the worst part is when that shit is over, bro. Like I, I, I remember I did a feature on Raj, and we talked about like that transition to fucking like being a living, eating, sleeping, and breathing football, and then literally like after like. One moment that shit is over. Like imagine your last game as a senior. Maybe you do pro day, and then the drafts comes, and you don't get that call. Fucking the free agent period comes, you don't get the call. It's like damn, this shit is over, and like everything that you've ever known is just done. And I see so many for like most college athletes, for when that happens, bro, you're definitely sliding. I know I was depressed. Can y'all say the same? Yeah, a hundred percent. I was like that too when I first got out, and especially like. And it's not even just so much – it's football for sure, but it's also a lot of the com- camaraderie and shit that comes with it. Because just like for me, I was with like a group of dudes that I was with every single day, stayed in a house with five or six dudes, and I saw them every single day. And it's like you come home, and when I came home, everybody was gone. Niggas was still at college or niggas was traveling or had moved. So when I got home from college, I went through a year or so where I had never felt more alone in my life. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody was gone. And it's a it's a transition period that I know a lot of my homies went through. I've talked to a lot of other people about it. Where it's just like, you don't really mentally prepare yourself for it. They kind of tried to prepare you for it. They did at Boise a little bit. But it wasn't like, I don't think it was as big as it needed to be. Like, yo, real life is about to hit for real. Like, football. And it should be something, like, they tell you. Early, like they say it, like, oh, not too many people gonna make it to the league. Whoop you whoop. Like, I get that. That's a fact. But, like, what are we doing to prepare? To prepare niggas yeah. for that. Like, really. So, yeah, it's, it's a thing for sure. Yeah, I can remember, like, at the beginning of every fall camp, like, some, like, uh, like maybe the dean of students would come in and, like, it's a new recruiting class or whatever. It's a bunch of transfers and everybody's in the room, whatever, first day of fall camp. Who wants to go to the NFL? Raise your hand. About, like, Everybody raised their hand, right? And it's just like, probably two of y'all in here will, will actually make a team. And that's them telling us, like, that's why we need to take grade series. But, like, even You when, ain't trying to hear that, though. Well, yeah, you're not <laughs> trying to hear that. But, like, all of us graduated from college. Niggas took took grade serious. That didn't stop us from having that down, that that um, that um feeling of, like, loneliness and despair and feeling lost. Like, what are, what in your mind, be like, what are some things we can do to prepare college athletes for life after college sports? Especially like when you you know you do everything right, you graduate, you play hard, all this shit. I don't know if that's right, but like you know you do everything they tell you to do. Like most of the times they like really preach that you know getting your degree shit. But even then, you know I had a degree and I was still a little lost. I think college sports, D one sports, by general, they're not you're an athlete. Like they're not looking at you as a student, in my opinion. They're not doing things to build you as a student. I know when I came in at Cal, like first day they give you a list of classes to take. Like they have classes already like selected out, you know. I don't think they do that no more. I know, like, Stanford got in trouble for doing something like that. But I think it's really developing students, you feel me, or, like, athletes, student athletes from day one, like, you're more than an athlete. You know, like LeBron says, like, I'm more than an athlete, right? He has so many different avenues now. But a lot of people don't aren't thinking like that, you feel me? They just think straight up, like, all right, football, football, basketball, basketball, whatever sport you're playing, that's all you're thinking about. You're so caught up in it, you know what I'm saying? But for me, it's like you got to have people, you got to have, like, support staff that's encouraging people to like, hey, get an internship this summer. You know what I'm saying? Internships were big, bro. <laughs> and I agree with that 100%. I think that that's really the head coach's responsibility. To me, that personally, that's what separates a good coach from a great coach to me. And we talked about this on my podcast, which are, well, I don't know when it's coming out. But it's like some coaches are more than just football coaches. They're life coaches. You know what I'm saying? They're teaching discipline. They're teaching sacrifice. They're teaching you how to basically be a better person to integrate into society and be productive. Luckily, I think I had one of those coaches in Coach Pete. You know what I'm saying? But I talked to a lot of the homies and they didn't have that. Like it was more ran, it was like it was ran like a football program. Like you said, it's less about being a student, more about football. But I think that's on the coaches to be like, yo, we have to build these build these kids and make them men, not just make them great football players. And I think if like colleges incentivize that in the contracts that coaches sign. As well, it's like, all right, if you don't go, you know, to the NFL, if you have, like, an 80% rate of co- of your players getting full-time jobs within a few months, like, you get an incentive. Just like you get an incentive for winning, you should have an incentive for, you know, 
your players graduating, your players getting full time jobs, you know. But I think, yeah, that's like a big thing. I feel like, yeah. but I think overall it's just like ex- exploitation. To some coaches, you're just a number, you know. And it's like some of these coaches don't even know their names of all the players. That's a you know, unless you're yeah. good. Yeah, that's you know that's saying? the definition <laughs> of like exploitation is like using a a person or thing for uh for only your gain, right? Like what are college athletes like what good is the degree if you don't know how to use it like if you have no guidance of like you know like no one's told me like so like i'm i majored in journalism and communication so i i knew you know and that's also from having like i was lucky enough to have a mom that went to college and have like you know had always been into writing and shit so i kind of i'm like an anomaly though so i knew if okay the league didn't work out i'm going to go home and i'm more than likely going to try to get a job as a writer i know how right. hard it would be to be a writer but i'm like okay i know like what i'm gonna do if this shit don't work out and that's not the case for most people so you have these young kids no matter what the sport is whether it's fucking i don't want to say women like women's field hockey because that sport in college is probably dominated by like women of, uh by white women right so like yeah. we know that they get getting internships and shit. we know that they get getting prepped you know, for life after sports. But for the most part, you, you look at sports like hoop track and football, where these are mostly black athletes who's helping, who's like, who's really helping guide them for life after sports. No one, bro. Like, you talked about internships. Really, like, that's a privilege in itself. To be able to work to and be not able get to, paid. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, what the fuck does a black student athlete who's or barely, like, what incentives do they have to work at, to work a motherfucking internship as opposed to a job in a mm-hmm. field that they probably ain't even gonna do. Like I know niggas who was working at like gr- grocery store clerks who was doing security and shit in the summer. You know what I'm saying? Why yeah. we had I had one of my white teammates who's like parents own some like some type of business. I don't know what the fuck they did. They were super rich though because it's like grandparents were boosters for our teams. And like he was doing an internship in a field. Like he was doing a real internship for like a, a accounting firm or some shit. And when he got done with football, the next semester that nigga had a job, job. up there. Like an, a high paying job. He had been interning for like four years at that motherfucker. But like, where are black students supposed to intern in these predominantly white institutions? Like, where, like, I don't know where I would have interned at, at fucking the university, the university in Moscow. Like and I know. I, know. Like, I yeah. don't know where I would I mean, I'm speaking from my perspective going to Berkeley. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like you have this tech industry out here. You have San Francisco. You have hella jobs. So it's like a lot of, like, my students over the summer, you know, I work in there now. Like, they're doing all these internships. Like, Tech in, internships paid. You feel me? Students going to work at like Golden, Goldman Sachs and shit like that. Law offices getting paid. But as an athlete, you don't have the time to do that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, especially you if you're flourish a football, as an athlete, if you're gonna flourish. Yeah. So you're supposed to, you know, you can't get a job at Facebook as a, you know what I'm saying? Like as a student athlete, you know, while you're in college, like that's impossible. You know, but you have a lot of these students now in college doing think, that. And I think that's just and asking set a up lot right after. of yeah. student athletes, bro, to. Excel in the classroom, on the f- on the field or court, and then to have another uh, to have a a job or like that's just asking a lot, bro. Yeah, I think for me, I was lucky because I had two two shoulder surgeries and a knee surgery. So like being injured, I was held with depressed, bro. Like that was like my self worth was playing. You feel me? And then being injured, having surgery, playing for a couple of weeks, having another injury, having surgery again. It actually like it was for me it was like a blessing in disguise because I was forced to think bigger than rugby like okay you feel me? Like, right, i gotta shit. think like this shit and you had to actually deal with it in real time like okay yeah. i can't play rugby right now what am i gonna do to keep my you feel me my mental sanity yeah <laughs> you know so i was like doing rehab and i got a job in the summer working at a law office and then i was also working in the city bouncing you know so like that for me was like a blessing in disguise i didn't see it then but now i'm like all right i'm a lot more prepared than like a lot of people i play with like what can i look at where i'm at now and it's because i had to face that like adversity when i was 18 20 you yeah. know what i'm saying Facts. but overall it's like these programs are based off of making money you know it's like multi-billion dollar industry like the ncaa is a 10.8 billion dollar contract for cbs or for like the tv and shit just for march madness and the players is getting pennies. zero <laughs> a 1300 dollars really <laughs> year after they had he was a um, point guard for like the championship team of uconn like six seven years ago and after the post game, they had just won the national championship, and they was like, "How does it feel?" And he was like, "Shit, it feel a lot better if my lights wasn't off at home." Niggas got a piece up on an E and J bottle after they won the fucking championship. <laughs> like, niggas like, just won the natty. <laughs> niggas won the natty. This nigga, like, I mean, I would be juiced, but like, I'm going back to Connecticut with my lights off. That's so burnt. Yeah, man, we got. I, I want better for student athletes, especially the black ones. 
Shit is foul. Hella foul. Hella black. So, if you're still not the listening to this, you know, like, don't just be like, all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just be like, all right, yeah, these, these niggas saying what they're saying, but I'm still just going to go to the league. You know, like. I was one of the rawest niggas in my <laughs> district, in my city, on my team, nigga. Trust me, man. It's, I know. And I know a bunch of niggas who are way raw than me, nigga, who are at home. You got you got to have a plan B. And I think it's often, I think when I was when I was playing, I was afraid that if I did think about other things, it would distract me from the, the my goal or something. But you can work hard and flourish while also thinking, at least starting to think about other things. I think that's fair. Yeah. So how was it for you graduating college, not going to the league, and then getting into this like professional, quote unquote, professional life and journalism? Man, I know, nigga, the first... I knew I wasn't going to the league after I did the CFL tryout in Seattle. At that point, I had like a shitty... Like my mind was just... My mind was just out of it. I'm like, okay, yeah, like, nigga, this don't even feel the same. Like something just in me was like, yeah, nigga, this shit ain't... This ain't it, pimp. Um, so I just kind of knew it wasn't happening anymore. And then the draft came. And, you know, them first within those first couple of hours, you know if you're about to get signed. It's a free agency, right? And... I was over going to the CFL tryouts. CF, oh, you want to talk about exploitation? Yo, I'm pretty sure. Rod, you ever been to a CFL tryout? And, 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 nigga, them shits cost a hundred dollars. You know that's that's big exploitation. And it'd be like it'd sick. be like a hundred <laughs> niggas there. It's hella hard to get reps. They only, uh, to get reps, they only like two hours. Nigga, I did one of those. I'm like, okay, I can I don't even have an opportunity to showcase my talent. Like, I'm not doing these anymore. So yeah, that's just but that's just playing. That's just. Uh, me speaking on when I kind of knew it was over, like after experiences like that. But I would say from June 2015, I graduated May 2015, June 2015 to about nigga July 2016. That was like, I had so many breakdowns during that 13 months. Like I'm talking, I'm talking about like actual like breakdowns, like moments where I would just like be in my shower, like boohooing, bro. Like feeling so worthless, bro. Like, Oh my god It was sick bro I had no Sense of identity I had nothing That I was known for And then you come home And niggas like Oh just go play For the Raiders <laughs> Like yeah I'm supposed to just Walk on <laughs> that, And that's the biggest thing That a lot of niggas Don't touch on Like when you come home For whatever reason You don't go to the next level If you didn't want to Or you just didn't make it You got hurt Whatever you come home and people act like it was just the easiest. Why you didn't go to the league? I thought you was in the league. And everybody's asking you that. And it's like, bro, if I could go to the league, I probably would have went to the league. bro. if it was that easy, I would be there right now. But, yeah, that's a that's a big thing because you're constantly reminded of it. When you go out, you can't shake it. Yeah. That shit fucking <laughs> sucked, bro. Oh, that was – and, like, nigga, I'm living in the neighborhoods that I grew up in. So I'm, like, seeing niggas that I've known since I was a kid – you know, everyone. When you get that scholarship, everyone knows. Everyone knows you get that scholarship. You sign D one in the town, you're automatically a, uh, a like niggas Star. think you're on league. Yeah. Like niggas automatically associate you with. At the time, it was like Sean and Josh was the only niggas in the league. You feel what I'm saying? And Marshawn Lynch and, and uh, Josh Johnson were like the only niggas in the league. I think from the town at that time. And then we had like other niggas. Um, Deshaun Gomes, he played for the Skins. Uh, who else from the town was in the league? That might have been like the only three niggas from Oakland, I want to say. Uh, Rasan Vaughn, he was in the league for a little bit. It was like, when you know, like when you a football is like a fraternity. Like when niggas is from the Bay Area going to the league, you kind of just know. Um, Humpty was in the league at the time. And like I was working out with them niggas and shit when I was coming home for, for spring break and winter break and shit. So you got like all the niggas who are already in the league, like, oh, nigga, you're a boy. Like you're going to be straight type shit. So, you know, not making it and coming home. That shit was rough, bro. It was rough as fuck. And like, like Raj was saying, like that's one of the hardest parts is running into people, people asking you what's up. You know, at the time, the Raiders and the Niners were both ass. So niggas just like, oh, you can go play for the Niners, nigga. <laughs> just play for the Raiders. Niggas not knowing, like, okay, I can't just walk into the facility like and sign yeah, up. Let me just walk into the Coliseum real quick. the Berkeley fucking Cougars. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cougars. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, that, that shit sucked. And then, like I said, I had always knew about journalism and shit. And I was, at the time, you know, that, that year that I just stated, I was writing a lot, but nigga, I was making like $75 a story. Peace, yeah. Like 75, I'm talking about nigga, it was like times where I was like, and then you, you, we're going through a process right now where a story that was written on us has been getting worked for like two or three months, nigga. So imagine writing some shit and, and just having hella stories months. like in limbo. 
and not knowing like literally like that's how I eat. You feel what I'm saying? So it was it was really days where like I wasn't eating, bro. I'm like walking from Berkeley to North Oakland to my granny house to get some food. You feel what I'm saying? Like that's the only I'm telling you, it, it was sick for me, bro. It was it was hard. Um but I, I don't know. Somehow I persevered. I like to I think that time period was such a traumatic time in my life that I've like pushed it into my subconscious because like I'm trying to like bring up I'm trying to remember parts of those that year or whatever. I cannot remember anything from I just remember like some of the feelings that I felt, but I can't remember like the fucking events that took place that made me feel so low. But I can remember breaking down, I can remember feeling really lost. Yeah. Definitely. What about you? I for me it was cause it was my it was my senior year, it was my last semester. And um this is also the time of like Mike Brown. And when Mike Brown was murdered in Ferguson. So for me I, I started to speak up about social justice, things that was going on in the community. And um like I was always doing a lot of work like with like, you know, student athletes giving back. Like I was, you know, they did like a little future story of me doing, you know, like community service work in West Oakland at the Boys and Girls Club. But as soon as I started speaking out about oppression of black people, Michael Brown and shit, I had the athletic director call me. Like, what are you doing protesting? Type shit. You feel me? It's like we shut down like one of the biggest like campus eateries um, on campus, you feel me? And I'm like, the next, you know, that same night they calling. The assistant athletic director's calling. Like, what are you doing? So for me, I'm like, all right, these motherfuckers not fucking with me. I'm on. I'm playing rugby too. So it's like, for those, only that, a- I think we talked about this before. I don't know if niggas yeah. don't know, but Cal's rugby team is hella fucking raw. Like, them niggas have one hella national championships and shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of two black people on the team at that time as well too. So it's like, my team isn't really feeling what I'm feeling. Like, I'm protesting. I'm being involved with like the Black Student Union. I have the athletic department on myself so i'm like fuck this shit i'm done so i, I quit but it was a sport that i loved you feel also me? in the sense you were damn near pushed out yeah at the same time yeah. like isolated knowing you know people wasn't fucking with it you know so like feeling pushed out and shit so for me it was just like this is a sport that i loved and then having to like quit just because I, I knew that wasn't fucking with me type shit i'm like if you're gonna use my image on this community service shit but you ain't gonna stand behind me when i'm like speaking my truth look at cat nigga won the walter payton man of the year award <laughs> for the same thing he got, he's being blackballed from the league for. You know what right. I'm saying? It's like niggas love selling this. Um, niggas love a revolutionary to it's time to love a revolutionary. Like that's yeah. just what it is, bro. But for me, it was like I, I feel like an identity crisis because all I knew was an athlete, bro. Like that's all I knew about myself. And you went to some storied ass programs, bro. Yeah, they was style football and then Cal rugby. And like I was playing for the USA team when I was 18 in yeah. rugby, like. I was like, oh, if you keep doing this, you know, you can play. You're going to be in the Olympics, all this shit. Coaches telling me this shit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And then to have all that shit end and just on the way it did, it's like, bro, I'm done because I know y'all not fucking with me type shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that was definitely tough just like – and then graduating and then not getting a job, like going through job searches and shit, bro. I'm like, literally not getting jobs, bro. <laughs> I mean, you yeah, know, yeah, me and you were definitely at the same – we like, were we both was, at a very low point at the same time. And I was like – you could think of a nigga like Rods who got into it, being an independent artist. Nigga, I know that shit had to be. You went from being at a story program like Boise to being an independent artist in a in a market like the Bay Area where we're constantly known for musicians getting the shit in the stick. What was that like? Like trying to transition from a division a a, ta- a tackle at a Division One program, going to fucking BCS bowl games and shit, to come at home trying to pursue a career as a fucking independent artist in a market that never gets any love? Um, For me, it was interesting because I was a guy like, when I went to Boise, I played, but I never never had goals of going to the NFL. I knew better. That's not what I wanted to do. I knew my heart was always music. You feel me? So in the dorm room, I was a nigga with the mic set up. When I I got to the house, I had the mic in my closet. Bitches used to come over and rap and all the shit. Niggas on the team would come over and rap. Like, when we did the little... uh, talent shows and shit i'll be up there rapping like everybody knew like even we had like after we won one of the fiesta balls they had like a little rally and i rapped at the rally like so i was always that pushing guy. that line so yeah. for me like coming out of college luckily and that's why like my experience is kind of different because luckily my passion wasn't the sport like i like the sport I knew what it was in terms of it being like a great opportunity for me to go get this experience with this great team, get my college degree and get, do it more so for me when I did it, it was more so for my parents than it was for me. I didn't really give a fuck about going to college, but I knew my dad did and my mom did. But for me, transitioning out into making music, 
like I just knew that's what I was gonna do anyway. So my mind was kind of already set on that. I never planned on getting a job. Like I was like, I'm not gonna work. You feel me? If anything, I worked to help my parents because they got their own business. So like, still to this day, I help them when they need to be helped. But like coming out of college, I always knew like I was gonna be doing music. That's a fucking blessing. <laughs> that's <what laughs> like, that has to be a blessing, bro. I think. Um, that nigga Ryan had went through something similar. I talked to him about that shit all the time, uh, especially like when I was trying to figure find my way as a writer and shit. But he was telling me, I remember that nigga, he had like chose to go, I think it was like go to some like writing clinic. Don't quote me on this. It was like an option between like going to do some writing shit or going to like fucking um, like a tryout for somebody. And he was like, nah, I'm fucking with this film shit. So like that, I like, I admire nigga. I envy niggas who like knew what they was doing while they were fucking in the midst of the college football shit. And that's such a fucking blessing, bro. And I recognize that like that's rare. You know, it's, it's, like, it's, an, anomaly. it's an anomaly. Yeah, like we're not the norm, nigga. Like nine most niggas don't know anything else but ball, bro. And I look at, for me, I I, I don't stay in contact with too many, too many of my teammates from college, definitely high school, and some JUCO niggas with the D one. I don't really talk to too many niggas from my, from my from my university, but um, I can see niggas is out there. <laughs> Struggling, especially stuff. my niggas from from the south, bro. Oh yeah. my god, them yeah. niggas, man, niggas, it's, it's it's wild, bro. So I definitely do want to see some systems in place to set athletes up for success with life after college and after fucking um, after after sports. Just you know, cause so many like some of most of the regular students they are working internships, they are really getting to to develop themselves outside of their sport. They getting to find other passions. They getting to trial and error. From eighteen to fucking twenty five, you know, we spent them five like twenty three years. years old. You know what I'm saying? Just finishing college, you have no work experience. Twenty nigga, I was twenty three. <laughs> nigga, I be trying to tell niggas I ain't had my first job till I was twenty three. Niggas don't be believing me. And even then, I was a fucking after school program supervisor making ten dollars an hour, working three hours a day. Come on, my nigga in the bay, <laughs> <laughs> nigga sound crazy. They got the fuck I put to survive off thirty six dollars a day. Yeah, man, that shit. I'm damn near nigga getting uh. PTSD Flashbacks from this shit <laughs> Shit Nigga gonna wake up In a cold sweat Thinking I've been Fucking Moscow I don't know. Bro I was working Fucking four jobs After I graduated bro Like Four different part time jobs Just trying to make That shit shake nigga, Just one, to fucking Pay rent out here bro One year I was a PE teacher A cameraman And working at a tech company I remember you was working For uh, Cal Sports Bay nigga, Area Cal High Sports All, all, that, all one, that shit All that one time Nigga I, I, was, bro, I was working Nigga what the Man I don't even want to say it. I don't know <laughs> if it's gonna be Problematic or not But I didn't You know oh, Yeah I'm definitely <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not saying it. Yeah, man. Shout out to all them student athletes, man. Shout out to um, Go Vandals. Hope them niggas get scraped this weekend. <laughs> I hated my coach. I be so envious of Raj. This nigga, like, he never has anything bad to say about Boise. I'm like, nigga, I wish, bro. Like, I wish, nigga. Like, I wish I, I had that experience at school, bro. Like, he never has. I'm like, and I, but I know niggas like that. I know niggas who don't have anything bad to say about their college program. I'm like, see, you went to a real program. And you didn't just play for a school. Like you obviously your your coaching staff and the culture of that team yeah. was bigger than just, you know, winning games. Of course. Yeah, it was it yeah. was bigger. So I always envy niggas like that, man. Yeah. But like looking at Berkeley, like Berkeley's such a renowned institution, but four out of ten black trash. athletes was fucking graduating. Black athletes. Wow, yeah, so like when And the we, team for and the, 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 the makeup is for sure like probably eighty percent of the student athletes at Berkeley are black. I would say something so, yeah. nuts because if and you think about the track team, the football team, the basketball, basketball team, team. Then you yeah. got a few people on soccer, yeah, two on rugby. But forty percent is grad, forty percent of your eighty percent is graduating. That's cute. I would love to see the statistics on like at like PWIs how much of the student athletes in in its entirety are made up of black students. Yeah, and of course you have like of like the major sports. Don't try to sprinkle in fucking field hockey and shit. <laughs> Sports that we ain't playing, right? Like the major sports, and I'm sure we make up at least at definitely eighty percent, right? But the fact that like millions and millions of dollars are being made for these institutions, and then the graduation rates are so slow, are so bad, like people ain't graduating, like that's an issue in itself. It's like at least if you're going through it and they're making money off you, you should be graduating. You know what I'm saying? And I feel what you're saying too, and I agree with your point of it needing to be incentivized because the whole thing is. It's like coaches focus more on winning than graduating because winning is what keeps their job and gets them paid. Like it's like if they were to focus on graduating 100% of their kids, they might graduate 100% of their kids, but they'll get fired. 
you can't graduate 100% of your kids and lose 100% of your games, then what? You feel me? Because then that goes back to the whole argument of, or the whole point of, like, it's only here to boost the economy for real. That's what it does. It brings money to the city, and only the wins are bringing money to the city. So it's like, it's a balance that head coaches have to find, and how do you graduate versus how do you win? Right, so it's like, it's a system issue. It's about the it's about the game. It's about winning. It's system. You feel me? So, man, hello, Black episode twenty five. You know, we definitely um, when me and Blake were like trying to come up with an outline for this yesterday. Um, one thing that crossed our mind when thinking about shit that we could talk to Raj about was definitely like Black entrepreneurship, and it's wild because essentially, like that's kind of what we're doing with the podcast. Rather, right? like, we're trying mm-hmm. to monetize our creativity. Um, and then also with the breakfast program, we just got that LL. We just like started Start the process LLC. Of like the way we were making an LLC. Process. We are yeah. LLC now. People's break, people's programs. Um, we're LLC now, like trying to navigate that. And it was why well, I remember Blake was like trying to do all the paperwork for the LLC, like doing hella research on Google and shit. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, if you could, I don't even know exactly you would want to say about black entrepreneurship, but it's definitely like something that comes up a lot in your music, Raj. And it's, and I know you talked about it a little bit earlier when you talked about your parents, like, having a business and shit. But if there's just... I'm like, how how have you found... How, like, how have you... How has the experience been for you trying to navigate this white capitalistic society as a black entrepreneur and someone that owns a black business? Do you have anything to add to that, B? Or is that straight? All right. Um, it's been a process for sure. But like you said, I had a little bit of knowledge coming in because my parents owned a business. So... Um, I kind of got to see how they really, you know, ran a business, did invoices, paperwork, accounting, all that kind of stuff. But it's like you get to a point where for me it was like when it got to the LLC, I was just like, what is that? You right. know what I'm saying? Like it was complete. I was completely blindsided about why I even needed it. What is it? What does it do? Like how to keep it up? And still to this day, it's a, a continuous learning process. Like I feel like. I'm always Googling shit and looking up different paperwork and all that kind of stuff. It's a process for sure. But luckily, you know, niggas got Google, niggas got YouTube where if you really want to figure it out, you can figure it out. And that's what I'll be telling all the young niggas is like, bro, if you want it that bad at this point, you can figure it out on the Internet. You feel me? You don't have to wait around for nobody to help you or hold your hand or nothing. It's ways for you to figure shit out. If you if you got the time and the dedication to sit down and really figure it out. You can figure it out. It's going to be rough, but you feel me? The shit that's worth it is always rough. So you feel me? Just figure it out. What was your inspiration? I know you talk about your parents being business owners. Like, I know you. your dad was in the party too. Has that inspired you about, like, yeah. you know, just being a young black entrepreneur? A hundred percent. Like, coming up, my pops is his. The main thing he would always say was, like, it's better to own your own because then nobody could take it from you. You know, he was always in the owning everything you know so it's kind of been instilled in me to own shit like even when i deal with you know different women or girlfriends or whatever it's like i'm trying to tell them like you working but how can you turn this into work for yourself even with the homies i'll be trying to tell them that because it's like with black people period in any field it's always a middleman before you touch the real bag you feel me you always have to go through something to touch the bag you know whether it be like with my sports, my niggas who play sports, it's an agent. With with rappers, it's a manager. With niggas who work, it's, it's your manager or your boss or something. But it's always somebody with a bigger check than you. The only way to get there is to own your own shit and figure out how to do it yourself. And I feel like that's why you have to respect the shit like title. You got to respect the shit like revolt. Even if you don't agree with them as men or whatever, it's like, yo, it's black owned shit at the end of the day. And it's trying, it, it's just set, even Nipsey shit. It's trying to set a precedent like, yo, bro, put it in your own hands and do it yourself. And as much as I fucking hate capitalism, um, and I understand like, so for me, I th- where I be having problems with shit like that is like people equate like ownership to freedom, right? Like in a in a white capitalist society, that can never happen. Right. Like but if you just buy black, I would all rather of a sudden, be you know, given police killings are gonna stop. <laughs> but I would, you know, like that's where I have a problem when people like say shit like that, right? Yeah. But I would rather keep my money coming in to me and my niggas than to some white folks. Like, Straight period, up. Period. Point blank. Like although I don't believe the capitalistic society will free us, I would rather support black people. Excuse me, the white people any day. And it's like it's impossible to be in a sea of capitalism and not get your feet wet. 
Like niggas try to act like they fucking super woke. You cannot escape you know capitalism like, unless you, you walk around this motherfucker butt naked and poor <laughs> and, and homeless. Like you cannot escape capitalism, bro. You cannot. No, like, no. We talk about this all the time, right? Like there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Like there, it's impossible to live in a capitalistic society and not participate in it unless you're just and you'll die. You will die not participating in the capitalistic society. Even you, even you look at the breakfast program. Even the people we feed is from capitalism. Like that's. People who funding our shit is making their money from capitalism. The clothes that we give them are a result of sweatshops and shit across the country. Right. You know what I'm saying? Ac- across the nation. So it's like literally there's no way to escape this capitalistic society. Um, but if we're going to be here making money, we might as well make our own. Anything that's taking white folks out of the equation, I'm with it. Yeah. 100%. I think that speaks to why we made people's programs. You feel me? An LLC and not a nonprofit. Yeah. Because an LLC is like we own everything. When you own everything, you can, send, you can say whatever you want. A lot of times when you have a nonprofit, you get these grants from these white foundations like the Ford Foundation or these big these big foundations that control what you say. They definitely you not going to be fond of this shit we be saying on here. So it's like if we saying fuck capitalism, fuck white supremacy, fuck all, you know what I'm saying, free Palestine, yeah. you know what I'm saying, we saying shit like that, money's going to disappear from the foundation. So like we made an LLC, so for one, we don't get, you know, we're getting donations in, right? We don't want to, you know, the IRS coming for our, <laughs> for us. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. learning from the past, you know. So yeah. like having an LLC allows us to say what we want, and we are the owners of it, right? Instead of a 501c3, it's like you're constantly relying on white people to fund you. Facts. You know, and even with the podcast, like we found a way to monetize a podcast. Even then, I'm pretty sure a lot of our money is coming from white people. <laughs> you can't escape them, nigga. I swear to yeah, God, but it's like can't. it's. We're still getting our money. We still say whatever the fuck we want to say. We're not worried about no sponsor. You know, like if we had, let's say. Wells Fargo. Let's say Wells Fargo was a sponsor of Hell Black Podcast. You know, they listen to a few of our podcasts like, oh, y'all talking about this anti-capitalist shit. We ain't, we take your sponsorship y'all away. About the prison system. Like, nigga, that's where we make all our money at. Right. Fuck these niggas. So. Yeah. It's wild trying to navigate like a white supremacist society while trying to be like unapologetically black. It's, that shit is wild as fuck. And I, yeah, like we were talking about code switching and shit yesterday. And I'm a nigga who, like, I, I didn't, like, I, I'm very familiar with code switching. And I didn't thought I did it until yesterday. And even like the way I did it yesterday was, it was in a way where it was like I wasn't like, I was policing the way I speak in efforts to not, you know, I was I'm not gonna say not offend, but definitely not to scare my colleagues, just because like if I talk to one of my if I if I address white supremacy, we were doing a, a white supremacy um, workshop at my at my job. And if I was to talk about the way I feel about white supremacy to my colleagues, the way that I talk to the way I talk about it to like Raj or Blake, they gonna be spooked. Period, bro. Right? They love listening to it, but you bring that shit to the workplace. That's a whole right. another. You feel me? Like that's a whole other like. You know what I'm saying? I. There are some, there definitely are some, we got some white fans on Hella Black for sure that fuck with the revolutionary politics that we have, but I didn't realize, like, I didn't realize that was fucking code switching, bro. Like, I, any, I policing, policing your emotions and policing the way that you speak is code switching. I thought, I always recognize code switching as like, oh, changing my tone, which is a result of, yeah. I didn't really, like, see how the, all those things were interconnected. I'm trying to stop saying fucking, um. What's the word that everybody loves to use these days? That can, when they can just say interconnected, intersectionality. Intersectionality, <laughs> yeah. I'm not even trying to roast niggas because I was using that word wrong for a long time too. Like intersectionality yeah. is not a word that you can just use when you're trying to connect things. Yeah, like interconnect. Yeah. It's a it's a like word different that's intersectionality strictly for the struggle, <laughs> nigga. Not Talk like we just oppression. can't be like yeah, like you know, it's like strictly for the struggle and you know addressing from what what I was explained. It was like it's a way to address the ways in which your many for your many ways. Of oppression and marginalization, and you know, yeah. you know, uh, are connected. Not just for like you can't just be using it to connect things. Like oh, you know, like you know, my fucking. I learned that my different forms of code switching just intersect. Like and these can't just be saying that. Yeah, but well, I think that's why it's important to have like entrepreneurship coming from us and ownership, because then you don't have to code switch. Yeah, if I you was the, if you yeah. if you have all money in, you control and everything. You don't have to do that. You feel me? Yeah. <laughs> But we're at the point where it's like you're trying to survive under capitalism. You need your job. You got to know how to code switch as a black person. You feel me? It's like I had to talk to a white person 
at my job. I was like, I haven't had to do that for a minute. So I'm like, I have to explain black issues to a white person. In a way that they'll understand. In a way that they'll understand. I'm like, bro, why am I talking like this? I was mad at myself for talking how I was talking. (laughs) Like, speaking hell proper and shit. Like, I should feel awkward as fuck. So, I don't know. I feel like our guests are going to be hot when we put Rex Life Rides in the in the um, description and, and we haven't really centered him. But also, <laughs> we we just... But like, I don't want to hear you and Delancey talk again. Yeah, nigga. Like, I'm trying to hear this nigga Rod speak. Rod in the fucking... <laughs> we, were, we were talking... Yeah, we try to like keep it authentic and shit. But one of the things we were all kind of talking about before we got live here was um, the idea of like basic universal income and I don't know that much about it I've seen like articles on it and from my understanding it's just like a way to come I don't want to say combat because the shit that's going on with AI um, artificial intelligence is planned it's like intentional right but it's a way to I guess fucking make the transition to AI easier on the people that are going to lose all their jobs what's your thoughts on the rush yeah uh, I'm with Rolla. I don't know too much about it, but I fuck with the idea of if you're going to take jobs from people, you need to find a way to get them money, period. You know what I'm saying? At least find a way for them to live comfortably if you take their job. You feel me? I don't know. the. I'm, I can't go in depth about different theories about it, but to me it makes sense because like, how are you going to displace that many people and then what? You feel me? What do you expect them to do? You feel me? Especially if it's no other job markets for them to get into with technology increasing and artificial intelligence spreading to other places like what do you expect people to do they got they have to live somehow you know so yeah i definitely think about that a lot especially with the work that we do with the breakfast program is like there's billions and billions of dollars in the bay area billions and billions of dollars in oakland you think like port of oakland is like one of the biggest ports you feel me silicon valley all this technology but you have people living in the streets yeah you have hella empty houses in alameda county enough to house every every person living on the streets you know so it's like for me, I think about basic income is like, yeah, if you're on the streets, like, why aren't we giving people $3,000, $2,000 stipends, you know, guaranteed housing, you know what I'm saying, and then like a job training program? Isn't that what like MLK was fighting for like in his, like the the last few years of his life? I've heard shit like that. I don't, let me see, where's the phone? That's what we got Google for. <laughs> I heard like that's like some shit yeah. that MLK was fighting for. I mean, for. he got popped because he was essentially being anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. Right, meaning like he was wasn't fucking with capitalism and wasn't fucking with the military. You know, he became critical of Vietnam, you know, and then yeah. like, all right, we can't you know, and then him and Malcolm started to become more aligned in their politics, right? Malcolm, you know, traveled and, you know, branched off from the nation of Islam and was like, you know, we need unity. But we also talking self defense. And King was like, Bro, I think I've integrated my people into a burning house. Shit, in twenty eighteen I think the house is burning. <laughs> Donald Trump, you know, all these rise of quote unquote racism. I mean, I think it's always been happening, but now everybody got a smartphone. So it's like, all right, I'm going to record your ass, you know, so you have permit patty and all the shit that's been happening. But now you have a cell phone and it's and social media is really kind of highlighting a lot of it, you know? Yeah. And um, in King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, he addressed um, guaranteed income, which is universal income, what we call universal income now. Yeah, so it's that's just is that a result of like would that be tied into socialism? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 some socialist shit. Yeah, like, and I think yeah, it's, it's wild. I, I think I they're doing like, it in Stockton. That black mayor they got yeah, it's like they're like a lot of people. You've seen a lot of conservatives pissed off about like them having basic income in Stockton. I think that's fucking common sense. That like that's we just give people what they need. This is the thing, right? With the with the with the competitive society like America, like people think that equity will replace competition, right? Like you hear like so like even with football, when I think about like equity, right? Like if I'm better than this nigga, he should not be able to play just because it's we trying to be fair, right? So it's like, but he's sh- um, the equity. The thing is like he's good enough to get a scholarship, right? Like all human beings are worthy of living and having their basic needs met. But you think about like. You know, there are some things where I do think, yes, like if I practice a skill more, if I if I put more time in learning something more than you because you choose not to, right? Like your basic needs are taken care of, but you choose not to do something else. And I choose to go above and beyond in it. Then I should have some type of 
um, reward for it, I guess is what I'm saying. But with most people, they fear that like basic income is going to take away that fucking, or like equity will remove, I guess, that. This idea of hard work. Yeah, or like this idea of like if I do something more than you or better than you, for, that, you know, I don't get a reward for that. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think every, every human being is deserving of housing. Like Fact, every human like, being is deserving of did, fucking water. So if of I food. run faster than you or jump higher than you or like I can code faster than you, I can write faster than you, that determines that you I, I deserve a house and you don't. That's sick. Right. Even if you look at the Bay Area, like how shit is segregated, like West Oakland and shit, you feel me? Like all the smog and environmental racism, you feel me? Like from the freeway and the Bay Bridge being right there. And who who is who has to deal with that? You know, like why people have asthma and shit like that, you feel me? Like it's a product of segregation and racism. Yeah. But equity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I think everybody deserves it. Everybody deserves a house, bro. Food. Because these are natural resources that have been commodified. Like, why the fuck? Like, water is, like, the fucking biggest resource on this fucking planet, and nigga. you for that shit. So and you pay, pay for, for fucking wa- what was water. What that movie with Justin Timberlake when the niggas was paying for, act- like, life? Like, actual time? What? <laughs> you don't, you never remember? You don't remember? time? Timeless or some shit. Yeah, yeah, it was some shit where they just like, like some Matrix type shit where um, niggas essentially could buy more time, and if your shit ran out, you died. Oh, was it with that pill or some shit? In time. In time. Yeah, that shit was nuts. I can't believe I watched the Justin Timberlake movie. <laughs> the fuck was I thinking? And nigga had cornrows. Oh, remember that nigga JT had cornrows? He was rolled up. <laughs> Braids and shit. He might have had zigzags, bro. Oh, fuck. And some bees at the end. Hella black, man. Kicking it. Speaking of bees at the end, you know what? It's kind of off topic, but you know what started this whole... We was talking about 6 9 earlier and how crazy shit is. You know what started all this shit? And niggas don't want to talk about it. Riff Raff. Riff Raff was the first nigga doing all that nutty shit. We should make this the extended part. So yeah, go ahead and let them know if this is the extended part. So you now tuned in to the extended <laughs> extended episode. <laughs> We're but gonna Riff talk Raff about was, that crazy shit. 